One of the most important steps in preparing to create the watercolor paper pendant, and I have a few laid out over here at various stages of development, is to actually prepare the watercolor paper. Here are some pieces that I've cut out in preparation for more pendants like this, and also for the one that you're watching me build in the video. And here's the sheet that I cut them out from. It is 24 hours later and this piece is completely dry and ready to be refined into a beautiful piece of jewelry. The wax is in place. No need to worry about the wax anymore. You can forget about it until you finish your sanding. You can cut off the extra pieces that are sticking out beyond the pendant itself. The wax is going to serve its purpose by being embedded in there and preventing the glue from clogging the channel that you constructed. Next step, you could either melt the wax out now, which I sometimes do, or you could start sanding it. This time around, I'm gonna sand it. And I like to use a sandpaper that's about 240 grit and start working the edges. Now there's a couple of approaches here that you can use. One is to do the whole thing manually. It's just going to take some time. And the 240 grit seems to be working fine. So if you have no fancy tools like a Dremel or a more professional flexible shaft tool that's used in jewelry construction, no big deal here. Use your hand, do some work, get it done. This is how my students do it in class, and their results are beautiful. If you happen to have professional tools, and of course I do, that does make the job go a lot faster. I have a sanding wheel on this. Always wear your goggles. Hold the piece securely. And work into the surface. The flexible shaft works with a foot rheostat. I'm controlling it like I would control a sewing machine so I can control the speed at which the tool is turning. And that's very helpful. My objective is to make all the individual layers disappear. So it becomes one nice, smooth surface. Now, even though I use the power tool to accomplish this, I almost always go back with my fine sandpaper. For some reason, I like to fold it over to make it a little stiffer. And then the finishing touch is done this way. Notice how I'm ignoring the wax. That is not an issue. At this stage, with the edge reasonably refined, and before I glue on the cutout shape of the painted watercolor that goes on the surface and becomes the surface, I'll melt out the wax. Why do I do it in this order? Instead of assembling the entire thing, varnishing, and then melting out the wax, like I did in my first watercolor paper pen and video that I published years ago. I've learned that it's better to melt out the wax before proceeding on to this stage because the heat allows the exposed paper to totally dehydrate. So the moisture content is very low in the paper and there's no chance of any blistering of 
the pendant when it's varnished and you subject it to heat again. The other issue was colored wax. Even slightly colored wax like we have here can work its way into the watercolor paper, the painted part, and damage the look. So this eliminates that from happening. I'll bring this over to the oven and we'll melt out the wax. To melt out the wax, I use a traditional toaster oven. A word of caution, the problem with an oven like this is the temperature when you first turn it on will spike. It'll get extremely hot, then it'll settle down to whatever you set the temperature at. The temperature for melting out the wax will be hotter than the temperature you'll use for hardening the varnish. So initially, when you melt out the wax, I like to set the temperature for just about 250 degrees. The uh, temperature indicators are worn out, but that's about where it is. And I have a temperature gauge here to read it as it goes up. This is a good temperature for the melting out of the wax. It's about 270 something degrees. The glow has stopped, so that tells me it's not gonna spike anymore. And to melt out the wax, what I do is I position my pendant on these little things that I've made out of actually watercolor paper. And I'll put it in the oven and set 250. I'll let it set in there for 20 minutes or longer. So it's been in there for almost a half hour. Let's have a look. Be careful. The oven is hot. Beautiful. The wax is melted out. Now we're ready to continue building the piece. When I take it out of the oven, what I do is I get a piece of the fishing line. Then I fold the cut length of fishing line in half, pinch it a bit. Then with a pair of pliers, I squeeze that pinch. And what that does is it locks the fishing line bend in place. Now I have it a, a very useful tool that is easily inserted into the channel. There we go. Work it through the other side. After I remove it from the oven, the next step is this. I take a length of this cord. This is twine that I actually purchased in the supermarket. It's, um, I think it's for tying meat, but it's wonderful stuff for cleaning out and assuring that the channel is opened. This piece has cooled down significantly because it's been out of the oven for a while, but often I'll do what I'm about to do as soon as I take this out of the oven and it's still warm with maybe a little bit of residual wax in there. And here's what we do. I take this twine, I tie a much lighter fishing line to the twine, so I have something that I could pull it with. This is six pound test fishing line. I put that in here, and I pull it. See what I'm doing? Yeah, I don't need that anymore. Now I have a way, maybe I have to pinch that down a bit, but I have a way of pulling my cord through. That's beautiful. And this is very clean. It's, nothing is coming out. Ultimately, that's how I'll insert the cord through the piece to hang it. So let's remove it. Let's move on to the next step. Put it on the side. I just want to talk about the uh, wax for a minute. What I used was sprue wax. This is beautiful wax. It melted out very clean. The cleanest wax I ever used. And I, I buy it by the box. It's not that expensive. The next step is to attach the cut watercolor shape to the form. This is the piece that I created in my instructional video on how to create the watercolor painting for jewelry. And the next step would be, normally, to 
explore the surface and find areas that you like. It's amazing what happens when you frame out a color area with a specific shape. In fact, coincidentally, I have two different side-by-side -side pieces right here, and they're both beautiful. In fact, all of these would work wonderful as jewelry. But what I'm looking for is something really dark. I want to make a dark one. And I like this. It has, it has hints of blues. It has hints of greens. Let's trace it. I haven't traced out the shape. Using my X-Acto knife with a new blade, I carefully cut along the traced line. And although I'm going to build this one now, because this is the one I originally wanted to do. So, put this aside for later. And we'll continue with what we have pre-prepared. This is important, as I put my cutout piece face down on paper towel. Then, Dipping my brush into the Lanco neutral pH glue and holding down my piece with a toothpick, I butter on the glue. I like to use a broad paintbrush for that. I also like to get a light coating. I don't go crazy with this side. I don't want too much on here right now. But I do like to have a thin layer of glue on this side. Kind of like priming it getting ready to attach the piece. Work fast. Don't take your time with this because you don't want it, the glue setting up. Move this out of the way. Put it face down as accurate as you can be with the paper towel protecting the piece. Press the piece down onto the body of the pendant itself. Then fold your paper towel over and over because you can actually see if it's lining up. And at this early stage, you may have the ability to just move it slightly. Then with my drumstick, I'm gonna very quickly burnish it, but I'm not gonna do this for very long. I don't want the glue dry because some glue may have seeped over to the face of the piece. It'll damage the paper if I allow it to harden. So, a very light mist in action. I don't want to activate the watercolor underneath it, but a very light mist in action is important. And remove this paper ASAP. Good. Now I cover it again. I found a dry area. I still have some life left in this. And once again, I can burnish it down. Remove it. Good. If it's not 100% along the perimeter, that's no big deal because you're gonna do a little bit more sanding and then you're gonna paint the edge. Within the first five minutes of attaching that to the body of the piece, continue to check your edge to make sure there is no lifting. Wash out the paintbrush. Now that the piece is dry, I do a final sanding to level off the edge of the newly applied watercolor painting to the body of the piece. If you look closely along the edge, you will see a difference in the level of the layers and I like to get rid of that. So, with my 240 grit sandpaper and holding the piece in a paper towel to protect the surface of the watercolor, I sand the edge. 
And with a clean, dry paintbrush, I like to dust it off. It's looking good. It's just about ready for me to paint the edge of the piece with watercolor. And then we'll apply the backing paper. I like to pre-dampen the edge because that facilitates the flow of the watercolor. Notice I haven't put the backing paper on yet. The reason for that is the backing paper is very porous and will absorb the watercolor paint. And I would like to eliminate that from happening. I want the backing paper to remain clean. So by applying the watercolor to the edge first, I don't run the risk of the paint absorbing into the backing paper because the edge will be dry. I have my phthalo blue and I flow it along the edge. Now, I don't want to keep it as a solid color. I'd like to work in a little bit of the cornacridone magenta. I apply some of that magenta to the lower area. And right about there, I want everything to blend. Carry a little of the magenta up there. Nice fluid flow of paint. So I'm going to go to my Windsor Yellow, dampen it up. I just rinsed off my brush. I don't want to introduce any blue or red into my yellow. And get some of the yellow down there. Good. We're just about there. Keep on flowing your edge color until you're satisfied with the degree of color saturation. The final step before varnishing and mounting the pendant on its cord is to apply the backing paper, the decorative backing paper. I like my pendants to have a very distinctive back that's different and contrasts and complements the front. This has turned into the standard paper that I use. It's that banana paper that I've talked about in my other videos. It's beautifully textured. And to apply it, I rough cut it. I don't worry about being too careful. But I am economical. So I position my pendant on the piece, and I simply cut out a rough shape. That's what I mean by rough cutting it. The next step is to position my pendant face down on paper towel. And with the glue nearby and a good old toothpick to hold things steady, I apply the glue to the back of the pendant Make sure it's 100% coated, but you don't need a lot of glue now. It's just a nice, even coat of glue. Then, I position the backing paper so it totally covers the back side of the pendant. And I press it down ever so gently. Now I can fold it over and make sure that we have everything worked down. Make sure there's no air bubbles, and there aren't any. And I'll allow it to dry. After it's dry, it's very easy to just sand the edge and get it clean. With the piece that you've been watching me build, I got carried away and smoothed the edge of the backing paper and actually signed the piece today's date. So I'll continue with removing the excess backing paper using this as my demo piece. Now one very easy way, it's very thin paper, all you have to really do is work into it with your sandpaper and that'll get a real nice sharp edge, beautiful edge. Or sometimes I prefer to use a round needle file and just cut off that excess paper with the file.
Okay, that is it. Now I'm going to go back to what I've been working on and continue with the varnishing. So I get these out of my way. Place my piece of jewelry on a paper towel. As you probably know from my other videos, this is the varnish that I use. Polycrylic made by Minwax. And there are other varnishes that can be used, but this happens to be my favorite because it results in a very hard surface. And I'll pour a little of the varnish into a container. This is extremely important. The varnishing stage can ruin your piece if you brush too much. Watercolor is water base. The varnish that I use is a water based varnish. Why do I use a water based varnish? Because it gives you a beautiful, crystal clear, non yellowed look. The key to applying the varnish, the first coat, is to dip your brush in the varnish and quickly just one stroke, one stroke, one stroke. Don't go back into it. It'll settle. Don't worry about the irregular surface look. If you go back into it after it's wet, you're going to smear your work. Another way to prevent it from smearing is to use clear gloss finish, still water-based. You can spray it on. This is foolproof in terms of smearing your paint, but to use a material like this, you need adequate ventilation and you have to wear a respirator. I never spray without wearing a respirator, and that's why I'd rather go with a low-tech solution, especially with my students in a class. I never let them spray. We always simply varnish it on with a brush and have never had a problem. And here, let's go for it. Dip it in. Streak it across, streak it across, streak it across. Leave it. Don't go back into it. That first coat is critical. Now it's wet. If I went back into it, I would smear it and ruin my beautiful painting. So I let it dry completely. Once it's dry, then you're in good shape. You can build up as many layers as you want. You can brush it. You can have fun with it. And ultimately, look at the surfaces that you could achieve. Look at that. That's my personal preference. You don't have to go that, that glossy. Two, three coats can be enough. And I'll let that dry. Now that it's totally dry, I can give it a second coat. You can see it even has a little bit of a shine to it. I dip my flat brush into the polycrylic and I can brush it on. There is no danger of smearing the watercolor underneath now that it's protected under a layer of dry varnish. Also, it's dripping down the side. So what I'll usually do is pick it up. If you have an inversion to get in this on your hands, I recommend wearing gloves, not latex. They make another variety of gloves in case you're latex sensitive. So we're on our way with this. Actually, that looks like it could be enough. I've already applied three coats. And by the time I get to my third coat, what I often do is buff the surface with 400 grit wet dry sandpaper. It's an extremely fine paper. What that'll achieve is a smoothing out of everything and any rough edges that you might have. And it's inevitable. In fact, I can feel them. I have rough edges there. That paper will gently work them away. Proceed with caution. You don't want to rub through and damage your painting. All I want to do is take away any of the residual sharpness. And that's doing it. That's, that's fine. It feels good. When you buff it with the paper, it'll dull the surface a bit. But this is so fine, I'm not scratching into the surface. Okay. Get rid of any dust. And now I'm ready for the final coat of undiluted varnish. I'm going to let it dry. And I'll wash out my brush and my hands. Because this is my final coat of varnish, what I usually do after I preheat the oven, the toaster oven, is I place the pendant in the toaster oven for approximately 20 minutes or so at 150 degrees or lower. 
that temperature will actually harden the varnish. Since it's a traditional toaster oven, it's not a convection oven. A convection oven circulates the air with a fan and maintains a much more even temperature throughout the oven. But the traditional one, when you first turn it on, as you just saw, has a temperature spike. And then the temperature gradually goes down to where you set it for. I set it at 150 degrees maximum because I have found, painfully so, that once it's varnished, anything higher can cause the varnish to bubble up. And then either the piece is ruined or you have a lot of work to resolve that problem. And it's very disappointing if you create a piece you really like just to have it get ruined by putting it in the oven. You can see what's happening now. My temperature in the oven is beginning to drop. And when it gets to about 150, I'll pop this in and leave it in for about 20 minutes. Of course, I won't put this in the oven until my most recent coat of varnish is dry and that still is not dry. I'm in another section of my studio where I have the toaster oven set up and I'm going to place the piece of jewelry on a tray and put it in the oven. Now the temperature is dropping down. I see it's at 120 degrees now. I usually leave the watercolor paper pendant in the toaster oven for about 20 minutes. I'm just about ready to take it out, but one final thing that I want to mention about the toaster oven is this is a dedicated toaster oven that I use exclusively for my jewelry projects. I never cook any food in it. And I advise you to do the same thing. Purchase a toaster oven or use an old toaster oven that you want to get rid of and use it exclusively with your jewelry projects. Never use it for food. Okay. Wearing a glove to protect my hand, I remove the pendant. And I turn off my toaster oven. I've removed it, it's cooled down, and it's basically finished. Beautiful surface. And the surface, as I rotate it against the light, you can see how it's picked up some of the subtle texture of the archer's paper. I like that. The back still hasn't been varnished. I don't varnish the back until the very end because I want to allow any moisture to be able to outgas through the back. Also, it will outgas through the channel. But now it's time to seal the back. So using the same varnish, I'll brush on a layer. And that's all you need. You don't have to build this up with multiple layers. The varnish will suck into this thin paper very quickly and totally seal it. And you may want to just wipe along the edge. Now I put it down and let it air dry. I need to emphasize at this stage that when you put it face down, be certain that there's nothing dripping onto the face because if there is, it can glue itself to the paper. And then you have a problem. I've seen students ruin their work because of that. So after you varnish it, just check and double check the face to make sure it's clean. And it is. After it air dries, I'll put it in the oven one last time and bake it at a temperature no higher than 150. And now it's at 142. That's good. That's a good temperature. And it's dropping. The back is completely dry now so I can return it to the toaster oven. When I do that, I remove the paper and I don't keep it face down. Now I turn that up because I don't want this against the metal surface getting damaged. Now, when I take it out of the oven, I'm gonna mount it. I'd like to give you an idea of the kind of cord I use. I use a satin cord and here's a color chart of all the available colors, which are beautiful. I happen to like lavender, I happen to like black, and actually any color that complements the piece. So sometimes I do color coordinate. If I'm not in the mood to color coordinate, I usually go with black. Before I forget, I wanted to mention size. This happens to be heavyweight. Heavyweight is not my preference. I actually prefer the petite or the lightweight. 
while I'm still waiting to take the pendant out of the oven, I wanted to show you the kind of clasps I'm going to use for this pendant. These are handmade. I like hand making them. And I'm able to adjust the size of the coil to fit whatever size cord that I'm using. If I need a larger coil, I use a homemade tool. There, we have a nail in that one. It's slightly more larger diameter than that. This is perfect to make larger coils that fit onto the cord nicely and you glue them in place, which I'm about to do. The solution here is your basic hook and eye. Very simple clasp. I think it's elegant. I think it's nice. To learn how to make this, you should watch my video on how to make the simple hook and eye clasp. It's been removed from the oven for a final time and I'm ready to mount it. So the first thing I do is I take a piece of fishing line and I make a tool that is very effective in getting the cord through the pendant because that's the challenge now. How do you get this cord to snake through? If you take this fishing line it's heavy fishing line, 60 pound test, and I cut a length. I crimp the bent area, and that kind of locks the bend in place, and you need to do that. Then this easily snakes through the channel. See? Beautiful, comes out the other side. The easiest way to get the cord through the pendant using the tool that you just made is to clean cut the end so you don't have a lot of frayed cord that'll get in the way. Then I take the length of the thinner fishing line. This is a six pound test. And I tie it into a knot. And let's use a double knot so it doesn't slip off. Then having done that, you're probably asking yourself, well, why don't I just snake this through? Sometimes the thinner doesn't go through. Now let's see if it does this time. It probably will, because that's a very clean channel. No, it's not. It's getting hung up. It wants to go straight. I take the tool that I just made and snake it through the pendant. There we go. Now, it's almost like threading a needle. Put that thin cord in there, pull the cord through, and out the other end. Beautiful. Tuck in the fuzziness and pull it. See how simple that was? Look at that, That's, that is absolutely beautiful. Now, I'm gonna attach my pre-made clasps. And I have the two that have been sized for this cord ready to go. Since I have a string tied around here, pull the fishing line with the attached cord through the hook. And I can trim off the rough end. Good. And I think I'm going to use a little of this thicker crazy glue. And put some on the end. You could wear gloves if you want to protect your hand from crazy glue. And I'm going to pull it through. Here, turn it around. Crazy glue should suck right in, but I want to make sure. Pull it up, pull it down. Yeah, work it nicely. Let it set up for a few minutes. Well, I've let it set for about five minutes, and I'm very anxious to get the other part of the clasp on. So, time to measure the piece. I want it to fall just like that. It should 
lock in right about there. <laughs> I'm going to cut the cord right there. Before I insert the cord into the coil, I put some crazy glue inside the coil. This way, as I push the cord in, it will pick up some of that crazy glue and spread it. And that is something I want to have happen. Good. Notice the twist in action? That's important. That helps. Yeah, that's coated nicely. And work it backwards and forward. And that is that. The watercolor paper pendant is completely finished. I hope you enjoyed watching my new video on how to make the watercolor paper pendant. Scratch me.